Link TV, connecting you to the world. Link TV is viewer supported. Watch more at linktv.org. Link TV presents Mosaic World News from the Middle East. Here are today's top stories. Israel raises Bedouin village in Negev Desert. Cameron visits Ankara, pledges support for Turkey's EU membership. And Ahmadinejad accuses U.S. Israel of plot to attack two Mideast countries. Mosaic World News from the Middle East begins now. في جانب آخر من المشهد الإسرائيلي هدمت جرافات إسرائيلية عشرات المنازل في Israeli bulldozers demolished scores of houses in the village of Al Arakib, north of Beersheba city in the Negev desert, and evicted 300 residents. Our Al Jazeera reporter said that Israeli forces completely wiped out the village from existence after cordoning off the area to protect the raising bulldozers. Al Arakib village is one of the 45 Arab villages in the Negev. Israel does not acknowledge their existence. Our correspondent Respondent Elias Karram paints a picture of the situation there. Israeli bulldozers left nothing behind but destruction in the village of Al Arakib. Within just a few hours, the village located north of Beersheba city in the desert of the Negev became history. The humble homes with their simple furniture were completely destroyed, and more than 300 residents living here were left homeless. They surrounded us from all directions. They didn't let us grab water or any necessities. What can we do? You had to leave everything behind? Everything. I swear the beds and the closets, they were all still new. What can I say? At dawn, the village had unexpected guests. Thousands of police members and special forces came, armed with weapons, supported by the Air Force. They encircled the village and provided protection for the demolishing machinery. This country does not retreat from its criminal acts on the Arab people, whether it's inside or outside the country. They created great havoc. Nothing escaped the bulldozers, not a rock, a tree, or even the birds. They killed life here, but they cannot kill the resistant and challenging spirit in the hearts of adults and children alike who wish to rebuild their destroyed homes. We don't have a home anymore, but we will stay here. We will not go anywhere. We no longer have a house. They demolished the homes of Saya, Ishmael, and Shama. Al Arakib village is one of the 45 villages spreading in the Negev desert, which Israel does not acknowledge, even though they were here before Israel was established. Israel seeks to displace the residents here and place them in eight residential complexes built for this sole purpose. This is full-scale racial cleansing. This is displacement and elimination of an entire village, erasing its identity and moving it from its land and taking it over, under the basis that they're planting trees and transferring it over to Israeli control. This is absolutely unacceptable. 185,000 Arabs live in the villages in the Negev desert, and Israel does not acknowledge the existence of half of them. Israel is trying to gather the largest possible number of these residents to put on the smallest piece of land and scatter the tiniest number of Jews on the biggest possible piece of land. Here, a village called Al Arakib used to exist. The Israelis wiped it out. Its residents say that they will certainly rise from the rubble to rebuild their homes and stay on this land to continue the resistance against the displacement project that has been ongoing since Nakba Day in 1948. Elias Karam, Al Jazeera, from the ruins of Al Arakib village, the Negev Desert. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu today blamed unnamed Israelis for systematically undermining efforts to enter into direct peace talks with the Palestinians. The Prime Minister was briefing the Knesset Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee. Joining me now in the studio is IBA's Eli Wagelanter, who spent the day in the Knesset. Good evening, Eli. Good evening, Yochanan. Yes, this is not the first time that the government has tried to blame the opposition for obstructing peace talks with the Palestinians. Sources are saying that Kadima leaders are sending a message to Washington and the Palestinians 
to wait for a Kadima government, which will be much more, which, which will be much more forthcoming in negotiations. It should be noted that Kadima leaders have always strongly denied these charges. The Prime Minister addressed the Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee today for three hours, saying once again that Israel is ready to begin direct talks with the Palestinian Authority as early as Sunday. The government is waiting to see what happens this weekend when the Arab League meets in Cairo. The Arab League meeting is expected to rule on whether or not the Palestinians should hold direct talks with Israel. But Netanyahu told the MKs that the Palestinians do not actually want to hold direct talks and that they're hoping the Arab League will block such negotiations. Netanyahu accused the PA of creating various obstacles to holding direct talks. First, he said, they cited the building freeze and later the issue of borders. I spoke, I spoke today with his spokesman Mark Regev and with Kadima MK Yochanan Plesner about the Prime Minister's stand on peace talks. The government of Israel is very serious about renewing the peace process. We're ready for the immediate resumption of talks with the Palestinians. We're ready to start those talks already next week. The Western world, President Obama, others are calling for direct talks. It's not happening. If they don't want to talk, we can't talk. So what do we do? Israel can hold out our hand and say, let's negotiate. If there's not someone on the other side to shake that hand and, and get involved in a political process, then I think it'll be clear to the whole world who is the rejectionist. There's a prime minister that is still uh, busy playing a blame game with everybody except himself, he's blaming the opposition uh, for the absence of, a, of a, a serious process with the Palestinians. He's blaming the Palestinians. He's blaming the international community for uh, marginalizing Israel. He's blaming everybody except for himself. In, in, instead of taking responsibility for, um, manu uh, for extracting Israel out of the uh, position, a corner that it's uh, been put into, he's busy blaming everybody. So what do you personally believe September 26th, will the freeze be lifted and building in these territories? I think that uh, there would not be uh, a resumption of the freeze in its current form by the cabinet. I think that uh, Netanyahu in this decision to continue construction without uh, reaching prior agreements on, say, limiting it to the settlement blocks and creating a clear distinction between the remote settlement and the settlement blocks. He's going to, again, uh, maneuver Israel into a corner. Israel will be perceived as, uh, and it will be sort of a, a, a stamp of approval that Israel is now the cause for the lack of progress in the peace process. It will affect us uh, other uh, essential and interests that we have. And I think that in this respect, the Prime Minister, again, is uh, proving bad judgment. And we'll have some more comments from MKs about the freeze, lifting the freeze, later on the show. All Thank right, thanks, Ellie. Official sources say that Turkey's economy started to effectively recover from the repercussions of the worldwide financial crisis in the last quarter of 2009. There are predictions that Turkey's economic growth might possibly reach 7 percent by the end of the year. This will make Turkey one of the fastest countries to recover from the world's economic crisis. However, even though Turkey managed to provide 1 1.8 million jobs in the last 12 months, unemployment remains the biggest challenge facing Turkey's economy. More than 3 million people are still unemployed in Turkey. While most countries are still discussing ways to get out of the world's financial crisis, Turkey is already talking about its expected growth, which may reach 7 percent this year. Official documents also indicate that Turkey managed to create 1.8 million jobs in one year, which is nearly the same number of jobs that all EU countries managed to provide in that same period of time. Economic growth seems to have given the Turks much more confidence in their political negotiations with the Europeans. Yeah. 
After China, Turkey is the second fastest growing economy. In comparison to the EU's average growth, our average growth is reaching nearly 25 percent. This indicates that Europe will not be able to play an efficient role in the world without Turkey. Many experts believe that the process of radical reform that the banking system has witnessed in the last year and the nature of the Turkish economy, which is described as flexible, in addition to Turkey's regional and international diplomatic activities, are factors that contributed to helping Turkey get out of the world crisis. The Turkish economy relies on small and medium businesses. This gives it the flexibility and speed to react and look for new strategies. It also helps that Turkey has good relations with the countries in the region and many countries in the world. Until recently, Turkey was living its own long-term economic crisis, even without the world's financial crisis. Today, even with the world crisis, Turkey has become one of the fastest countries to get out of it. However, this does not necessarily mean that Turkish economic problems have ended. Unemployment is still a painful wound in the body of the Turkish economy, especially when more than three million people are still out of work. Meanwhile, many experts believe that the rising Turkish lira is the real obstacle facing the increase in the volume of Turkish exports, which accounts for approximately $130 billion per year. Amil Rafi, Al Jazeera. Istanbul. Istanbul. British Prime Minister David Cameron affirmed his country's support of Turkey's full membership in the European Union. This came during his visit to Ankara, which is his first visit to the Turkish capital since being elected as the United Kingdom's Prime Minister. Cameron's conversations with his Turkish counterpart, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, included matters related to the Middle East, Iran and Afghanistan. Cameron stressed Turkey's role in these issues. British Prime Minister David Cameron appeared to be very enthusiastic when he announced his absolute support of Turkey's membership in the EU during a speech he made in front of the Union of Chambers of Commerce and Commodity Exchanges of Turkey. Cameron criticized the opposition to Turkey's membership in the EU by saying, I'm here to make the case for Turkey's membership of the EU and to fight for it. Turkish-Israeli relations were an important part of Cameron's meeting with his Turkish counterpart, Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Despite Cameron's criticism of the Israeli attack on the Freedom Flotilla, he hopes that Turkey and Israel will maintain their friendship. I know that Gaza has led to real strains in Turkey's relationship with Israel, but Turkey is a friend of Israel, and I urge Turkey and Israel not to give up on that friendship to give up on that friendship. The Iranian nuclear issue was also included in the discussions. Western countries, including the United Kingdom, are still urging Turkey to reconsider its position on the matter. But Ankara insists that there is no other solution to the Iranian nuclear issue than diplomatic means. As for the sanctions that were imposed on Iran, our position is clear because of the Tehran Agreement. We had essential reasons for signing that agreement, most important of which was to resolve the issue diplomatically. According to Cameron, one of the reasons for visiting Turkey is the economy, as economic relations between the two countries are growing and bilateral trade has exceeded $9 billion in 2009. In addition, Turkey has welcomed nearly 3 million British tourists in that same year. David Cameron enthusiastically reiterated the British government's support of Turkey's entry into the European Union, which undoubtedly pleases the Turkish government. In any case, Turkish-British relations remain distinctive on all levels, according to officials from both countries. From Istanbul, Abdel Nasser Singhi, BBC. The Iranian president says the United States and Israel are planning to attack at least two countries in the Middle East within the next three months. Mahmoud Ahmadinejad says this is part of a plot to exert 
more pressure on the Islamic Republic. President Ahmadinejad said in an exclusive interview with Press TV that the United States and its ally Israel are planning to wage a new war in the Middle East. Here I announced that they have decided to attack at least two countries in the region within the next three months. Ahmadinejad says the plan is only aimed at stabilizing Israel in the region. All these games are aimed at helping the Zionist regime survive. The Iranian president says the West is pressuring Iran over its nuclear program with two main objectives. Their first objective is that they want to prevent Iranians from progressing. They want us to fully depend on them. They lie when they say they are against nuclear weapons. That's why I asked them to bring the Israeli nukes on the spotlight. But they refuse to do so. Their second objective is that they are seeking to rescue Israel, which lacks legitimacy in the region. Ahmadinejad lashed out at the latest round of sanctions against his country just after Tehran, in a confidence-building measure, agreed to a fuel swap declaration brokered by Turkey and Brazil. He rejected claims that the sanctions have been effective in persuading the Islamic Republic to come to the negotiating table. The logic that they can persuade us to negotiate through sanctions is just a failure. We have been for talks all the time. We have never stopped negotiating. If any talks were suspended, it was on their part, not ours. The Iranian president said, however, that Tehran has a number of conditions for the upcoming round of talks over its nuclear program. Among the conditions that Ahmadinejad outlined are one, other countries should be included in the talks in addition to the five permanent members of the UN Security Council plus Germany. Two, they should voice their stance about the Israeli nukes. We want them to say whether they accept or oppose Tel Aviv's nuclear arsenal. And three, they should clarify what they are seeking through negotiations, friendship and cooperation or hostility. Ahmadinejad said Iran is always open to any kind of negotiations for deepening cooperations and the talks should never be used as a tool for further dominance. His Majesty the King discussed with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu ways of advancing efforts to resolve the Palestinian-Israeli conflict on the basis of a two-state solution and within a regional context that could bring about security and stability for the entire region. The meeting during Netanyahu's brief visit to Jordan also dealt with, di with diplomatic efforts aimed at preparing the right environment for direct and serious Palestinian-Israeli negotiations that tackle all final status issues. His Majesty stressed that comprehensive peace that guarantees the rights of all parties is the only way to achieve security and stability in the region. He said this demands concerted efforts and a stop to all unilateral actions that are hindering progress towards a two-state solution and the establishment of an independent and viable Palestinian state that lives in peace alongside Israel. King Abdullah urged for utilizing the current opportunity for peace, which he said is anonymously demanded by the international community and is a strategic solution that serves the interests of all parties. On the ground, meanwhile, clashes erupted between Palestinians and Jewish settlers in the West Bank after settlers entered the village of Burin apparently to stir up trouble. The clashes left injuries on both sides with two Palestinians and four settlers hurt. The town residents said nearly 70 settlers entered the village and demolished a newly built Palestinian house. Iraqi lawmakers canceled a session of parliament that was scheduled for today, saying they needed more time to decide who will hold the nation's highest offices. No date was set for a new meeting. They say the top offices, including the prime minister, president, and speaker of parliament, must all be decided together. More than four and a half months since the vote, Iraq's Shiite, Sunni and Kurdish political factions have been unable to reach an agreement on who will be prime minister. An MP from the state of low bloc of Prime Minister Nur al-Maliki said the blocs asked for another opportunity for extra time to agree on the three positions.
Today, the American army transferred control over the Zulu military base in Wasit province to the Iraqi army. The American army had taken over the base in the north of the province. The Zulu base is considered to be one of the most strategic military sites due to its size, important for both security measures and to maintain control over the land within the borders of neighboring Babel and Baghdad provinces. The Iraqi-American security agreement has started to be widely implemented. One of its terms stipulates that military bases must be transferred to the Iraqi army, primarily because of the approaching departure of the majority of American forces from Iraq in April. The Iraqi soldiers, represented by the 1st Regiment of the 32nd Brigade, officially received the responsibilities of the Zulu military base, located in El Suera province, north of Wasit province, which was previously run by the American forces. Today we received the site located in El Suara, and as you know, it is one of the hot spots. This is an indication of the seriousness of both the Iraqi and American governments in implementing the agreement to withdraw the forces and control the Iraqi territory. It is a tactical and vital base that grants members of the Iraqi army the capability and access to provide security in order to control the territory and the ports near Al Swara province, in addition to the capital Baghdad and Babel province. Security in there for the last year. Uh, the Iraqi Today we are transferring another military base in El Suwara to the Iraqi forces who will continue to maintain security and order. The Zulu military base is the eighth base to be handed over by the American forces to the Iraqi forces in Wazit province and is now their responsibility. American forces in the province only have one main base left, known as Delta, which is expected to be transferred to the Iraqi army after the complete withdrawal from Iraq in 2011. In solidarity with Lady Fayrouz in the face of the lawsuit that was filed against her by the heirs of artist Mansour al-Rabani, hundreds of artists and citizens demonstrated in front of the National Museum and called on the two sides to resolve the case. This report by Rabia Shantaf. <laughs> This voice in his absence has become less powerful judicially. Lady Farouz is forbidden from singing roles composed by the Rabani brothers, including 25 musicals. This after the sons of the late artist, Mansour El Rabani, Osama, Ghadi and Marwan, filed a lawsuit over the artistic legacy of the Rabani family. They believe that the heirs are entitled to receive royalties from each work that is composed by their father and used by Farouz. Since the case is no longer a family issue and has now become a case of public opinion, hundreds of artists and Farouz fans demonstrated in solidarity with her and in honor of her career. They chose the stairs of the National Museum as a symbol for their demonstration, which was organized alongside a demonstration in Cairo. The fans of Fayrouz organized this protest, invited me, and I responded to their call. What's the problem? I have no comments to make today. Today I will only listen. We listen to Fayrouz, we don't tell her anything. She doesn't need my support, but a great woman like her is a symbol for Lebanon, a symbol of justice and liberty. I am here because Fayrouz's voice is here. If her voice was not present, then probably most of these people would not have come to the museum. They came to tell her how much they need her voice. Time and place is determined by Fayrouz's voice not by where her voice is forbidden. Regardless of the reasons behind the case and the motivation of those who proposed the ban, the fans of both the Ambassador to the Stars and the Rabani brothers don't care about this conflict. All they care about is listening to the voice of their beloved singer. They describe her as the symbol of Lebanon, and some even say that she is above the law. 
Banning Ferouz from singing angers many of her fans, who eagerly hope that this case will be solved with love, regardless of how complicated it is. From in front of the National Museum, Rabia Shanta, Future TV. The views expressed on Mosaic are from contributing broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible from support of viewers like you. Thank you. Watch Mosaic World News online, stay up to date with breaking news, read our blog, get transcripts of past shows and more at linktv.org slash mosaic. This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. network dedicated to global and national news, uncompromising documentaries, and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.